I'd go over there right after school and I saw uh, the doctor the day before the operation, the doctor was nervous. Uh, he said, I think we have a good chance and so on and so forth. But when he came back up, it was though a great weight had been lifted. I remember um, how upbeat he was. And he said, Mrs. Wright, the operation went very well. And we would expect to have him on his feet tomorrow. Now that was unheard of at that time, that you got somebody up after surgery at his age uh, a day afterwards. Instead, he died the next night. Um, it was a very, it was something he didn't expect at all. He just thought he was going to the hospital. We thought he was going to the hospital. But he was, uh, you know, uh, just short of his 92nd birthday. And, my mother was killed when I was uh, almost five. After my mother's death, of course, my father was completely uh, over overcome. Uh, but he did his very best when he was around me. I remember going down there the day after and to, down to the chapel uh, yard and all you could see was the top of his head. He was digging the grave by hand himself. And uh, I asked him the day after the accident happened, and I said, uh, uh, did you bury Mother and Daniel today? And he got a great big smile on his face, and he said, yes. What that smile must have caused him. I think they were quite a couple, and it was a real Everybody says that about their parents, but his sister um, said, Brandock, if you could have seen them as you are now, they were so amazing together. Um, it took me a year before I accepted my grandmother as being a proxy, you know. But both my grandparents were um, uh, very, um, very gentle about the whole thing. There were times when I got out of hand, there's no doubt about that. You didn't do certain things, or he got unhappy, and if he got unhappy, it could lead to something really unpleasant. I, people don't imagine small boys having a pillow fight with Frank Lloyd Wright. And it, at the at what he considered to be the legitimate end of this incident, he said, okay, that's enough. Of course, I, being a small boy, kept on going. <laughs> and the next thing, I found myself flying through the air over the end of the bed. My grandmother came in from the other room and said, Frank, what are you doing? How can you do that? And he said very shamefacedly, he wouldn't stop. <laughs> I went wherever they went. Um, I uh, showed up at speeches, and my grandfather went down to the student union at Madison. There's this huge crowd. He's going to speak in the hall, and uh, they're obviously there to see him. And he gets out of the car, and this pathway opens up as if by magic. But he's wearing a medal that he got from King George. <laughs> It was the King George medal anyway. Big gold thing with bright blue ribbon. But it was under his vest. And I thought that was terrible. So I remember rushing back to him saying, Grah, take your medal out so they'll know who you are. <laughs> he bought me my first cello. He uh, actually first full-size cello. He got uh, my second pony. He uh, allocated one of the Taliesin horses. Uh, he bought me a team later on, which was clearly an act of uh, giving it, indulging a feckless child. <laughs> Gra was the name that I called him from the very start. They never changed it, Ghana was uh, my grandmother. And uh, Gra gave Aaron this model to make, which is over at Ilsa, the, the Jester House. And 
My father was doing a big bottle, but my father said, I bet you a steak dinner that I'll finish mine first. And when they were very close to the end, Aaron said, he stayed up all night with me and finished mine so he would lose the bet. <laughs> and uh, that sort of thing made him mostly uh, fast friends. Uh, he could be very rough with you if you didn't get out there to do the work. A lot of people didn't like that. But uh, he was uh, absolutely uh, determined that you should be there because my grandfather was uh, determined that you should be there. If you weren't there, the famous comment is the guy telling <laughs> that he didn't eat breakfast in the morning, so he didn't see that he had to be there at 6.30, but he'd be there by 8 o'clock every time. And Cross said, I don't care whether you eat breakfast or not, you're there at 6.30, period. That's what time it starts, the day starts. There were things like that to keep running, work crews. Uh, uh, my father did all that. He uh, was the farmer. Uh, he was the CEO along with a lot of the people during the uh, Second w War, and uh, they came to pick him up. So the two FBI guys stayed all day long uh, talking to my grandfather and waiting out in the office. And he would come out periodically and say, look, you're taking one of my chief workmen. Uh, he's the guy that runs my farm, uh, everything here. Uh, you're taking a very key guy. And they said, it's OK, we'll be back tomorrow. And they never came back. And the only reason that my father could think of was that he really did run the farm and they were living off of what they got from the farm. There was simply no income at that point. They were also living off of my father to a certain extent, cash-wise. Whenever Graham wanted to get something done, he'd say, find Wes, get Wes, tell Wes I want to see him. And, uh, my father knew that something was about to happen, and he did that in this case, and my father turned out the whole drafting room and threw people to work that had, hadn't seen any physical work for a long time and created something in 12 hours that uh, couldn't have been done. There was a fountain, and uh, he, they poured cement for it, and. There was no way the cement could dry, but my grandfather wanted a fountain running there. So they put a pump in <laughs> that was not meant to be a submersible <laughs> and plugged it in from the outside and posted an apprentice beside the pool to make sure no visitor put their finger in it. <laughs> when he would help me with my algebra, that is solve the algebra assignment, uh, I was sick for three weeks and he did that. He just did all the homework. And I said, look, why don't you tell me how you're doing this problem? And he looked at me quite, um, not amusedly, just sort of far off look in his eyes. And he said, uh, I don't know. And I thought at the time he was just passing me off, but I don't think that he was. He honestly didn't know, but he could arrive at the answer. A week before he had his fatal stroke, a man from MIT came to uh, the archives and he had made an appointment and they asked him, what uh, drawings would you like to see? And he said, I didn't come here for the drawings. I told you that. I came here for, to see the calculations. And they had a couple, three, four boxes of my father's unorganized calculations. They put him in a room with all those boxes and forgot about him for three, four hours. And finally somebody said, do you think that guy's died? He's never come out of there. Maybe we better go look. 